Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, my name is Hrvoje Nikšić. Uh, I'm probably best known as the author of GNU WGET, but these days I work on completely different things, uh, mostly in Python. So today I will talk to you about uh, async await. Now, what's, what's the big deal with async await? It seems to be something that uh, everybody is having. The libraries are being quickly updated to, to gain support for async await. Uh, uh, so C Sharp had it first. Uh, Python got it soon, JavaScript got it, I think, in 2015 or so, ECMAScript 6, and uh, Scala has it, uh, uh, Rust has it these days, even C++ is supposed to get some sort of async await by C++ 20. So let's take a look at uh, what, uh, why we need this kind of thing and uh, how it's implemented in Python. Well, first, when we talk about async await, the async stands for asynchronous programming. Uh, and asynchronous is the opposite of synchronous. So first, let's see what's the, what's the deal with synchronous programming. So synchronous programming simply means that uh, all the functions that you call, all the entry points of your API, wait for things to happen on the system in regards to other systems. And this typically refers to I.O. and more specifically networking. So for example, if you, if you have a function that uh, tells the system to connect to some other system, then the synchronous function will wait for the connection to actually be established as, determined, as best determined by the system. Or for example, if you, if you have a function that uh, resolves your host name to an IP address, uh, then this function will wait for this to actually happen before returning the control to your program. And if you think about it, this actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, uh, how else is it supposed to return the IP address uh, if it doesn't wait uh, for the IP address to actually arrive from the DNS server? So, uh, and the same stuff for, I don't know, reading from a socket. If you read the next line from a socket, you actually have to wait until the data is received so that, uh, that you can read it. And for these reasons, uh, all the traditional I.O. is synchronous, so for example, Python file objects, the stuff you get with the normal open built-in, completely synchronous. C, STD, IO, completely synchronous. Uh, BSD uh, network sockets, by default, if you don't tell them otherwise, they are fully synchronous. And this, for, for many purposes, this works just fine, and it has worked fine for years. But there are situations where this is simply not enough. And that's a simple case where you need to handle more than one connection at the same time. So for example, a typical example is writing a web server or something like that. You want to handle two connections without waiting for a slow one to finish before you can handle the second one, obviously. Or for example, you might be writing a web crawler and this crawler definitely wants to talk to several hosts at the same time and not uh, uh, only, only one at a time. And so, if you're stuck with these synchronous APIs, where you have to wait for everything to happen before you can do something else, then the only way you can do parallelism is by spawning multiple threads or processes. And that's an issue, because a thread, although much more lightweight than a process, is still comparatively heavyweight, especially uh, compared to a simple uh, connection or to just an open file, some file descriptor. So simply, you can have many more connections on the machine, then you can have open threads. And, uh, and that's a, the most basic limitation of synchronous I.O. There are also other problems. For example, uh, if you have multiple threads, each doing uh, its own thing, you cannot cancel this thread. So for example, if you have a, a simple desktop program that, that connects to several hosts, maybe in order to, to choose the fastest one or something, and then the user presses cancel, uh, you're all these synchronous connections in these different threads, you are at the mercy of the other side when uh, they will exit. So you cannot really cancel a thread. Some people have tried, POSIX threads have tried implementing thread cancellation, but it didn't really work. Java gave up, Python never had it. So the upshot is that synchronous I.O. is sort of easy to use. It's uh, especially easy to pick up, and it's really nice for these uh, demo programs for schools and so on, but it scales really poorly, and it, it has some really uh, bad uh, downsides. Now, to the asynchronous I.O. So 
Asynchronous I.O. is, as the name implies, sort of the opposite. So and the question is, how does that work then? So with asynchronous I.O., you have API calls that, that return immediately. By immediately, obviously not in literally zero nanoseconds, but the point is that they never wait for the other side to do something. So you call an async API, and it will return immediately, so to say, either completing the operation and telling you the result, or failing with a very specific error code that tells you that you should try the same operation later at a later time. And this error code, which tells you to try again, is literally called E again on Unix systems. So, so you're supposed to wait for maybe a second or, or whatever and uh, to, to try your read again, and then maybe it will work. So with an asynchronous API, uh, you always have to, to know when to return to this asynchronous call again. Now, this is somewhat of a problem, because if you try reading something from a socket and it tells you that you have to try again, the question is, how soon should you try? Like, should you wait uh, for a second or for a millisecond or for a minute? And you, you, you basically can't know. So the answer to that is uh, a second uh, operating system call, which is traditionally called select. And there are more modern versions such as PAL, EPAL, uh, KQ, and wait for multiple objects, whatever. And this one tells you when you can actually repeat the async operation. So the thing is, correct code now needs to first try the operation. Then if the operation fails, wait for as long as this Paul call tells it to wait, and then try it again. And if you, if you think about it, at first, this sounds really insane. Like, <laughs> first I told you that the big problem with sync IO was that you had to wait for everything. And now, not only do you have to wait, but you actually have to have three operations. Like, first try this, and then wait, and then try it again. So what's the, what's the advantage? And the answer, the, the thing that changes everything, is that this Paul operation can wait for multiple connections at the same time. And this is really a big thing, because this allows you to have one central place that does all this waiting, and that place is typically called the event loop. And then these individual operations that do something with a single file descriptor, when they receive this E again uh, error, then they tell this central place, they sort of subscribe to, to an event that says, oh, hey, by the way, when this file descriptor 38 becomes readable, then please uh, wake me up by executing this function. And the remaining code that they actually need to do is then in this, uh, in this other function. And so uh, in basically every async program, there's this central event loop that uh, does this kind of polling. And then based on what happens in the poll, it dispatches. And it's called an event loop because it's literally a loop. It, it has a loop that uh, polls. And the events that it dispatches are those kinds of things like uh, this file descriptor became readable, this file descriptor became writable, uh, that timeout of, of uh, five and a half seconds has elapsed, uh, uh, this synchronous operation in this thread pool has finished, and, and that kind of thing. So that's one thing you get this architecture uh, that has a central event loop. And the application logic is cut up always in these tiny callbacks. So you can no longer write this uh, nice uh, asynchronous code where every operation follows every other operation and everything looks like in school. You have to, you have to juggle with these callbacks and, and send state between them, and the application becomes more complex. So the upshot of asynchronous I.O. is that it's uh, harder to use, especially harder to pick up, but it scales really, really well. Because if you want to, you can have like thousands of connections in a single thread, and you can also use uh, multiple threads if that's what you desire. Not in Python, though, because of the gill, but in other languages you can. So speaking of other languages, Let's talk about JavaScript. I, I assume you have all worked with, with JavaScript at some point in your lives, right? OK. The silence tells everything. So 
The JavaScript is, is a good case study of async because it's uh, all async uh, from the ground up, from the very beginning, and the event loop is kind of invisible. So uh, there is an event loop. You are obviously running inside of an event loop, but uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is no event loop object that you talk to in most cases. So instead, each async call, which, is, which would normally just return a value or do something, accepts a, a continuation callback. So this function that will be invoked when whatever this async call was supposed to do is actually ready. And what would normally be re the return value of the call becomes uh, the parameter of the continuation callback. That sounds really weird, but it's easier to explain in practice. For example, if we have this kind of function that is uh, supposed to print hello, then sleep for a thousand milliseconds, and then print world, and this is what you would write it in a language that supports blocking call. Now, the only problem with this call is that uh, there is no sleep function in JavaScript that would work like this, because if it existed, it would block your, your whole program, which is single-threaded by default, and your, your little animations wouldn't work, the UI would get stuck, uh, that would be a tragedy, and, uh, uh, and in, in earlier browsers, even the whole browser would, would, uh, uh, would be stuck, and obviously we can't allow that. So instead, JavaScript requires you to write this function like this. So you start the function by doing this thing that is non-blocking, this is console log, that works fine, and then instead of waiting, you call this function called set timeout, which accepts two arguments. One is the amount of time that needs to pass before doing something, and the other is the function to invoke after this uh, timeout elapses. And our greet, greet function exits immediately, returning to the event loop which does other things, and sure enough, a second later, uh, this, uh, this uh, message gets printed. And that's fine as far as it goes, but one has to wonder, like, uh, how, how does that work? I mean, okay, here we have, we have this uh, anonymous function with this nice arrow notation, but what happens, for example, if we need to print two messages, or three of them, with, with two sleeps? Like, how, how do we do this? Well, the obvious answer is actually the correct answer. Inside a set timeout, nobody forbids you for, from writing another set timeout. You're actually supposed to do that. So this, this is the way you would, uh, you would write uh, uh, this kind of code in JavaScript, at least initially, if you just use this uh, set timeout function. Now, this is becoming a little bit worrying, because you can see a trend here that uh, what was here in, in the synchronous version, simple code that just did things one by one, here somehow becomes uh, this more and more nested code with more and more nested, uh, uh, nested lambdas, uh, these anonymous functions. And that, uh, that seems like it won't uh, have a good effect uh, uh, eventually. So let's take a look at a little bit more complex function, but still quite a simple one. So consider this function verify user. It's supposed to, it has uh, three blocking calls to some database of users, so one uh, that uh, has to check the user's credential and return some uh, additional user information. Then we, we get the roles of this user, some uh, additional data from the database. Then we log that the user has actually accessed the system. And finally, we return this initial user info. So that's simple enough. However, each of these accesses to the database can block, so we, we mustn't uh, we, we mustn't write it like this, and in JavaScript, we can't write it like this. So how do we write it? Well, each of these functions has to accept, as we said, this continuation callback, and then instead of returning this information such, a, such as user info, it has to pass that information to the callback uh, function. So then it has this charming outlook. So. Uh, this, is, uh, this has the appropriate moniker in JavaScript of being the callback hell. Uh, and, uh, and, and this shape here is the, the so-called pyramid of, of doom. And, <laughs> and that's a hell for several reasons. I mean, one, the obvious one, that it looks very ugly. And uh, the second reason that it's really hard to debug because you have all these nested callbacks. And also keep in mind that this is very simple code. This, this is basically a trivial function. It's also a very similar function as what you get if you just Google callback hell. Uh, 
the other problem is that error handling is repeated all over the place, and if you forget it anywhere, then these errors will just uh, they will they will vanish in in thin air. So this is something that you don't want to base your production code on. So people were wondering about this mess of callbacks and. Uh, one idea was, well, okay, if callbacks are so hard to, to use, maybe we are simply lacking the right abstractions to tackle the problem. Maybe we need better, a better, more high-level abstraction than just a callback to program asynchronously. And uh, indeed, several of such abstractions uh, were, were promoted, and some of them were actually pretty good. And the best one that at least uh, uh, stuck to this day in, in JavaScript and that had the most success is the so-called promise. So with promises, this code looks much more reasonable. Uh, so the idea with promises is that each asynchronous operation, instead of accepting this continuation callback uh, argument, returns a promise object. And the promise, as the name implies, represents the promise by that function to resolve the promise by filling, in, filling the return value inside once, the, promise, once the, uh, the conditions are met. So for example, here this internal check user function returns a promise, and then this promise has a then method that allows us to chain, uh, to add a callback to the promise. So we, and this adding of the callback returns another promise. And so to this, we chain again, then we do this log access, and then we return the user info. And finally, we return this whole high level promise to our caller. So this is obviously better than callback hell for at least two reasons. We got rid of the pyramid of doom. Uh, we got rid of the explicit callback parameters everywhere. We again have functions that return something more or less meaningful. And uh, error handling is much better because now when you chain these promises one, uh, one in the other, if any of these callbacks uh, uh, throws an exception, then this will be noticed by the promise and the promise will be in an error state uh, itself. However, there are still problems uh, uh, with this code. First, it's still based on callbacks. So, so you're, you're, you cannot, uh, for example, have ifs uh, that uh, easily jump between one code and the other. Uh, if you want to have a for loop, uh, then you have to use a completely different mechanism, for example, by using something like a tail recursion of these callbacks uh, or by using special for each combinators. And even the simplest things like just uh, running uh, uh, a function one below the other, which is something pretty normal in most programming languages, with this async stuff, you need to use special combinators such as this then. And if you have something actually more complex, like uh, a loop inside a loop uh, where the outer loop uh, has a break statement and inner loop has a continue statement, which is a pretty normal thing in, in, in business programming, although we may not like it, but it's, it's how the code gets written, this is a huge problem with, with async. There are whole stack overflow uh, questions with multiple and quite complex answers explaining just how to break from the middle of a for loop executed with, with promises. So still this reinventing of the control flow and this feeling of having a different language is really an, an issue with using promises. And here is with where async await enters the picture. So with async await, this same function looks like this. So instead of using all these uh, promises, we just write async function, verify user, and where we call the stuff that returns promises itself, we use the await keyword. And the code looks exactly as if were written in a synchronous fashion, however, it works completely asynchronously. So in JavaScript, this function returns a promise exactly like this function. When you use it, there is no difference. And also, inside, inside this uh, async function, you can await anything that returns a promise, regardless of whether it is written in this async fashion or not. So we have the synchronous look and feel, 
completely synchronous and we have async execution. By synchronous look and feel, I mean that we can use the for loops here, we can use break and continue as much as we want, and it will work just fine. We can use try catch, uh, complete native control flow. So the question we will now try to, to answer is, how is this implemented specifically in Python? And uh, what what we can we, we can do with it? How how does it work uh, from the from the inside? What's the magic? So, in Python, Python actually uh, had its own async story. So, uh, most of the Python standard library is synchronous, unlike JavaScript. But uh, it had a strong uh, ecosystem of uh, third-party uh, async libraries. Uh, the async library actually present in the standard library in Python 2 was called async core, and it was pretty bad. Nobody wanted to use it because it was seriously underfeatured, and it was basically impossible to improve it without breaking backward compatibility. But uh, uh, the third-party libraries such as Twisted uh, uh, were pretty great and used in production. So for example, a Twisted uh, uh, is uh, like a large framework for doing async programming. It has its own uh, abstractions uh, similar to Promises. Uh, its abstraction is called Deferred, and you can read up on it. Uh, it supports a bunch of protocols, a bunch of different transports, TCP, UDP, SSL, you name it, and people have been using it for years. Then there's Tornado, which was open sourced by Facebook and which was more based on an HTTP server and high performance story. And finally, there's a G event, which is based on a C Python specific implementation of green threads. Now, all these frameworks were really nice, but they had one problem, and that's that each one had its own event loop. So, and as we, as we saw, in every async program, there's this central part, an event loop, and each event loop assumes that it's at the center of the universe, or at least at the center of, of your program. So there is no way, at least no normal way, to combine two event loops, or more than one, in any way, in the same program. So for example, if you wrote a piece of code using the twisted abstractions, it could run only under twisted. You couldn't run it under tornado or under G event, and the other way around. So at some point in I think 2012, during uh, fairly early Python 3 development, uh, Guido noticed this problem, and he started to work on uh, a fourth <laughs> or whichever async library to fix the issue. But instead of trying to outdo all these uh, uh, other async libraries, although he tried that too, but instead of just doing that, he first made sure that this library contained a pluggable event loop, so that the event loop is specified, and this allowed uh, to have one event loop that is actually in the standard library, which all these uh, uh, frameworks can hook to. So if you, if you write, uh, so as, as soon as uh, Twisted got its, uh, its uh, support for this event loop, then you could uh, write uh, Twisted code and async IO code in the, same, uh, uh, in the same program. So pluggable event loop was one important feature, and the other was to support both uh, uh, classic callback programming, which it called futures in, uh, in uh, uh, async IO, that's like deferred or promise, uh, but uh, under a new name, and to also support the use of generators uh, uh, as these uh, async coroutines, and that is what we will uh, take a look at uh, shortly. And this is what became async await uh, uh, in the end. Of course, once async IO provided these nice features, then uh, immediately came uh, uh, other contenders, like there's this UV loop, uh, which is a fast, uh, high performance uh, drop-in replacement for async IO, written in Cython for, for speed and based on this UV lib, also used by Node.js. So if you're doing some uh, async programming in Python and you need high performance, do look into UV loop, it's pretty great. And there are more modern libraries by people who wanted to to sort of rethink uh, how async is done in Python and which are based on coroutines first. But this async await uh, thing is uh, built into the language and it is not tied to async IO. So if you understand how async await works in Python, you will be able to equally use async IO, UV loop, Curio, and Trio because they all use the same underlying mechanism. So let's look at that mechanism. <coughs> 
So let's return to this verify user function again, now in, in uh, Python syntax. So here we have, again, these three places where this function needs to, to sort of wait for something to happen, where, which would be in, uh, in uh, uh, synchronous programming, these would just be blocking calls. So our goal is to find a way to write this function almost exactly like this, so without cutting it up into four or five uh, weird little callbacks, which would look even uglier in Python than they did in JavaScript, because Python doesn't have multi-line lambdas. You would have to invent names for all these functions, and you would have all kinds of problems. And anyway, this is Python. We want to use normal syntax. We won't stand for these weird things. But <coughs> somehow, to suspend execution, so assume that this function is being evoke, invoked uh, not by normal synchronous code, but by some kind of event loop that, no, that is aware of these suspensions. So at each of these minuses, we need to somehow suspend execution, and after whatever this was supposed to be doing was ready, we must resume execution at that exact place in the function with the local variables being intact. So this sounds pretty magical. However, in Python, for a long time, there actually existed such exactly such a magical uh, mechanism to do so to a function. And that's, that's simply a generator. So in Python, there are these generators there which, which are defined by functions that contain a statement called yield. And this yield statement, when invoked, basically drops out of the function and the code that uh, invoked the function through a special protocol called next would get the would would receive this value returned by yield and then it could choose to obtain the next value so basically these generators uh, originated as a really nice way to to uh, uh, support iteration driven from the from the outside but we could easily imagine abusing them for for uh, the use in uh, async programming. So let's just replace this minus sign with the yield operator and see how far it gets us. Because it looks like it just could do the job. Because at each yield, we will have a suspend, and we will allow the event loop to wait for uh, as much as necessary to, to do the job. And uh, these, uh, in Python, the generators even allow the, the outside code to provide, to insert a value into the generator so this yield becomes an expression. That already existed in Python 2. It's, it's an old thing. So this sort of looks like it could work. And people have tried to make it work many times. But there are at least two problems with it. Uh, the first problem is if you think about it, this inner async call, like check user, probably that is another, it might need to be another generator or at least something quite complex because uh, it probably has to uh, write some message to the database and for that it has to yield to the event loop until the socket becomes writable or however it is writing to the database and then it needs to read the response from the database. So then it has to again yield to the event loop and suspend until uh, the socket is actually readable. So where we have one suspend, we might actually need two or three or five or who knows how many suspends. And here we hard-coded only a single suspend. So we might need something like a for loop with yields or, or something like that. And that becomes pretty ugly uh, pretty soon. And the other problem is that we wrote return user info here. In Python 2, this would actually be a syntax error because uh, generators don't allow return values. Like you can return in the middle of a generator, which simply means you want the generator to stop iterating as if it came to the end. That's fine. But return some value, that's just syntax error. So these two problems is what Guido was uh, trying to solve when he was designing uh, async IO which was still called Tulip at the time. And the solution he came up with is pretty ingenious. So him being Guido, he simply invented a new keyword. Well, not exactly a new keyword, but a combination of two keywords, but uh, a, new, a new kind of statement. So that statement is called yield from. It's only valid inside a generator, 
and you give it any kind of iterable, but typically you give it uh, uh, another generator. So when you, when you call yield from some iterable, that's at face value sort of equivalent to doing 4x in iterable yield x. Here we, we use underscore instead of x to signify that uh, this x is, of course, uh, not present in our scope and that we don't even care about the particular x. All we care about is forwarding this value to, to the whoever calls us, maybe another generator, maybe the guy who is calling next uh, in, in sequence. And this is actually useful in normal generators as well. Like, for example, if you if you have a generator, let's call it sec, that accepts a number and it yields this number and then a larger number and another number. And now let's create a function that prints that generator. We'll have it accept any kind of iterable. Let's say for Iterable print v. Okay, and we call it with print iter of sec of zero. And now, if we invoke this, we get zero, one, two. Okay. And so, if we want to create now a larger generator, which sorts of uses this generator as if it were a function, let's call it, I don't know, 2sec, which uh, says, and now we can use this yield from sec of zero and yield from sec of 1,000. So, and let's use this 2sec here. Okay, we invoke that and we get what we expected, as if, as if this uh, generator were some sort of function that we invoked here. So this could also be done in normal generators by just using a for loop. But now, imagine if there are many of these invocations, if we are using generators as a really important uh, uh, tool of our abstractions, that we, we don't want to have these for loops all over the place, not only because they lo look ugly, but because they, they, they give a completely wrong impression. Because in this case, we don't care about the values actually produced by the generator. And this might be the case or not in plain generators, but in generators that serve to implement async functions, this is definitely the case, because in that case, each of these yields is something, it's just an instruction to suspend to the event loop. So the one that calls the generator is definitely not interested in the objects produced by the generator because for the purpose of this 2sec, this sec isn't producing anything useful. The numbers it is producing, whatever these are the values, are only useful to the event loop, which in this case, we don't have a real event loop. We have a for loop that prints the iterable, but that's, uh, the, it just shows the, the idea. So that sort of solves one problem, it allows, now if we just switch from yield to yield from, then every async function can, some, can suddenly be implemented uh, via a generator, and we can just call async functions using yield from. And uh, however many times they suspend, we never even see these individual suspensions, we just forward them to uh, the one who called us, and that one will forward them uh, up and up and up, and finally they will only be observed by the event loop. They will be, uh, they will be completely invisible to the, the generators in the middle. But the remaining problem we have to solve is this return value. So uh, the thing is, if, uh, if we imagine this sec to actually be some sort of uh, async function, which suspended three times not to provide some numbers, but to actually uh, do something useful with some sockets or whatever, then once it's done, it has some information from a socket which it wants to return. And in Python 3, this is a valid statement, and this return value gets picked up as the value of the yield from. So yield from is actually not a statement, it's an expression. So we can say something like val equals yield from, and then print uh, result 
uh, let's say, val. We can even directly use it uh, in a function call like this. And then we have to add a, a parenthesis for historical reasons, but that will go away with a wait. And then when we invoke, so this is the full code, and when we invoke it, we get really interesting output. So this, our event loop, our printing function that actually exhausts this top-level iterator, sees all these yields, so we have yield zero, one, two, and then the caller of the, of the sub-generator gets the return value. So with yield from, we actually have two lines of communication. We have these naked yields from the lowest level generator, which go directly to the event loop because they are just forwarded, they're propagated by, by yield from, and we have the actual return value, which is seen not by the event loop, but by the actual yield from at the site where the yield from was used. And that's exactly what we need to implement async. That's basically our tool. Because uh, so the suspensions are global, they go to the event loop, and the returns are local, they go to the caller. And uh, just one thing, this, uh, so, so with that we can write code. But let's just take a look at how this is actually implemented. Because as you, as you know, normally uh, in, in Python, Every iteration is implemented as, uh, as uh, uh, um, there's an iterator object, and you invoke some next method on it, and it returns value until it reaches top iteration. So for example, a for loop is basically syntax sugar for this kind of code. Now, I have intentionally used this sec without the return. So first, we get some sort of iterator, like here. And then we call next on this iterator. There is in, in Python, there's a global function called next for that. So we call next of it, and we get the first value it, uh, it yields. Next gets to the second value, the third value, and finally, you get a stop iteration exception. And now, this result, if we have an explicit return, then what happens here? Again, let's create an iterator. And now when we call next, once, twice, third time, and now we have the stop iteration exception, but now the return value is simply attached to the instance of the exception. So that's how Guido implemented this uh, return uh, uh, statement inside generators. Simply, when you catch to the stop iteration, if you care about the return value, it's right there in, uh, in uh, the exception instance. And so the full, or at least fuller, expansion of the yield from uh, expression is a loop like this. It looks scary at first, but it's actually really simple because we have an iterator, uh, we have an iterable, sorry, we convert it into an iterator. In case of generator, this conversion is practically no op. And then in a seemingly infinite loop, we retrieve the next value of the iterator. If we retrieve it successfully, we just yield it, we propagate it. Again, these underscores uh, signify that we don't care about that value at all. We, we don't want to see it. And once we get the stop iteration exception, we retrieve this value slot from the exception and we store it to our variables or wherever the yield from, uh, the yield from expression was actually used. So this kind of thing, is uh, is now complete. So return v in a generator gives you the value. This value you can pick up even e either using yield from if you are calling this thing from another generator, or using uh, or by directly accessing the stop iteration if you are doing it from synchronous code. I also have to mention at this point that uh, the actual desugaring is somewhat more complex because there are other features that generators support, such as uh, uh, throwing an exception into the generator, inserting this value into the generator, and closing the generator due to finally statements and such. So, but this is the actual essence. So this, this other stuff is, is just for completeness. But you can look at the pep, and it's like a screen full of with a small font, but still. It's all implemented very efficiently inside the interpreter, so it works uh, approximately as efficiently as a normal function call. So with, this, with these uh, generator-based coroutines, 
we can get back to our verify user function and see what it would look like using yield from. And basically, it looks exactly the same. We just replace yield with yield from, and we pretty much get the semantics we expected from async await. So the rules are coroutines always yield from other coroutines. So if you just call this database.check user username password, you won't get a, a fancy promise. Like in JavaScript, you will just get, get a generator. And then you either yield from it or you call next on it. If you're inside the generator, you yield from it. And when the inner coroutine suspends, we will do so automatically. Since this yield from has a loop built in into it, it can suspend as many times as it wants, including it can choose not to suspend at all. Maybe it has the value already cached somewhere and it can just return it to us and there will be, the event loop won't even be consulted zero times. So we will just get our value immediately without going through this whole, whole uh, stack of, of uh, yields. And also, yield from can be used anywhere inside the coroutine where you could use a normal expression. Like uh, here we use it just on the right-hand side uh, of the uh, assignment operator and at the function top level, but we could also use it in a uh, function call argument, uh, in a list comprehension, really wherever you can, you can think of. And so this is a very high-level coroutine. Now the interesting thing is what do these other coroutines look like? Like, for example, here we call this get roles or this check user, and how, how would, would we implement that? So the answer is that that would also be a coroutine. Now, let's imagine that we have some database object that has some sort of low-level socket associated with it. So this get roles uh, uh, method w could reasonably be implemented something like this. So we have uh, uh, we create a request, some sort of binary uh, blob from, uh, from this actual user info, and we write this request to the internal socket. Now, this write itself has to be asynchronous, otherwise, again, it would, it would block us, and it cannot be the normal os.write or socket.send or something like that. It has to be something special, and this coroutine has to be provided bar by our async library. And again, we read the response by reading, uh, by calling again this function, let's call it read exactly. For simplicity, let's assume that all the responses from the database have exactly the same size and we read that many bytes. So we get this binary response, we parse it into something that's useful to our caller, we return it. So this is fine, but again, it sort of turtles all the way down. So where does this end? What, what's, the, what's the outlook of uh, uh, this coroutine that actually talks to the system, like right? Well, it looks somewhat like this. So it, it has to have a loop, simply because uh, uh, every write can write less data than you, than you actually give it. So even in blocking code, you have to have a loop that loops while the number of bytes written are less than the amount of data you sent it. That part is fine. And here we have this, uh, this uh, uh, idiom that we saw from the, at the beginning. So we try to write the data. If the data is written successfully, fine. We, we, we uh, increment the number of bytes written, and we probably just return right there, because we will probably write all the data at once. However, we catch this blocking IO error exception, and this is the exception conveniently raised by Python 3 in case any async call uh, returns this E again status. And in that case, we yield to the event loop. Now, this this is where the buck stops. There is no yield from here. This is just a naked yield. That means now I have to yield. I can no longer proceed, and, and that's it. But we don't just yield. We yield some marker to the event loop that tells the event loop when it's supposed to resume the whole thing. So here we, we wrote this as a sort of want to write uh, 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 object, some marker object that will be recognized by the event loop, and that contains the file descriptor that uh, needs to be pulled for, for writing. And the event loop, once it sees that the whole thing just from some next produced this want to write object, it would, it would just register uh, in, in its central polar, oh, by the way, when this descriptor becomes writable, just 
call this thing, and this thing is again next of this iterator that it actually sees, and it would return right here and continue uh, with the writing. Uh, at the end of the lecture, I can even show you there's a, like uh, a, a small, you can write a small event loop that works like this in like half a screen of code that actually has these objects like won't read and won't write, but we don't have time to, to, to look into, into these now. So to, to summarize, the whole thing using yield from works like, like that. Everyone uses yield from except the actual low level code, which just suspend to the event loop with the naked yield. The, the yielded object is visible only to the event loop because all these other guys just forward it using yield from, and that's the object that most likely tells the event loop when to actually resume the whole thing because that's the, the useful thing to do. For any of this to work, the entire call chain has to be async. So this is what people often ask on Stack Overflow and elsewhere, like, oh, you know, this is all fine, this uh, async await or yield from or whatever, but, you know, I'm inside the callback of my legacy uh, music player or something, and just in this one place I need to read something from this coroutine. Isn't there some way to, to just do it? Well, the answer is not really, because uh, each async function has to be able to suspend all the way to the event loop. And so if, if you're not inside a chain of yield froms or awaits, as we will see later, then this is simply not uh, possible, at least not without major tricks with threads or other dirty stuff. Uh, another thing that might be worth mentioning is that contrary to what many people think, uh, async coroutines do not make use of these extended generators. So this kind of generator where you, where you use this uh, send function to insert the value into the generator that becomes the value of the yield expression. Python supports that, but async.io at least doesn't use that. In async.io, yield is used as if it were a statement. So, so you actually don't need to, to have that capability to implement uh, uh, async style coroutines, but then you need something like yield from. So, so uh, a, a simple yield statement is not enough, but uh, uh, this is, and it's fairly efficient. So, almost an hour into the talk, we are finally, <coughs> we are finally at the topic of uh, uh, async await. So, uh, the good news is that if you if you have a conceptual understanding of how yield from works and this whole generator stuff, then await is pretty much the same thing, at least in Python, but also, as we'll see, in, in uh, many other languages. So await is a sort of syntax sugar over yield from, which was introduced to, to for several reasons. Uh, the most important reason is to reduce confusion, because uh, uh, in Python 3.4, I think, uh, there was only uh, yield from, and there were these two very incompatible uses of generator. So in, in, in one case, you use the generator to, to actually do something useful, like to produce, I don't know, file names or your Fibonacci numbers or, or whatever, and you, you care about what they produce, and that, that's it. And there's this other use case where the generator is sort of abused to produce some objects which aren't useful to you at all, which you're just forwarding upwards uh, to be used by the event loop, and they have these weird return statements that you actually are, that you're actually interested in and that you pick up using yield from. And that was really confusing. Like, you could uh, send uh, one kind of generator into a function that uh, expects the other kind of generator, and it would appear to work. But of course, it would produce really weird uh, exceptions at, at runtime and much later, only after this generator would actually become, uh, after it would produce a value which would, be which would be the wrong kind of value, and so on. So to reduce that confusion, this was completely uh, separated. So a new kind of function definition was uh, introduced, an async def. So an async def defines a so-called coroutine function, and when you create this, when you call this coroutine function, what you get back is a coroutine object. Both are sometimes colloquially called coroutines, uh, but uh, it, it's usually understood from context which one uh, we mean. And only inside these async defs you can use uh, this await keyword, which uh, is then known to synchronize with another async operation. However, 
behind the scenes. A weight is actually just a really small wrapper, a thin wrapper around yield from. So a weight requires a so-called a weightable uh, expression and uh, not uh, just any generator. Uh, but uh, it, will, it will just call uh, some special method under under weight it's called to convert this weightable into an actual generator and then behind the scenes it will use this uh, this yield from uh, uh, this yield from loop to extract the values out of it uh, and to to synchronize with the event loop uh, there's just one case where the generators are still useful, and that's this lowest level code, which you typically don't write. It's written by the author of whatever async framework you are using, but still it, it's good to be aware of it. So you ha there's this special decorator types coroutine that makes uh, any uh, generator uh, awaitable. So, uh, yeah, when, uh, yeah, let's just, let's take a look at an example, actually. So. This is uh, the code that does uh, parallel uh, download. So this code, use, this is the classic code that uses uh, threads. And uh, it makes use of this uh, really nice uh, concurrent futures uh, library available in Python 3. If you're doing something in Python with threads, by the way, I suggest that you take a look at concurrent futures because it's very, very elegant. And it uses a third-party library requests, also very famous, to actually fetch the stuff. So, so here we create uh, a thread pool. We submit uh, to that thread pool the requests uh, with just a normal synchronous function to load each of the URLs in the list. And this function will simply call requests get to read the content, and it will print the length of the URL. So that's as, as simple as it, as it gets. And if we run it, if that's the one. Okay, if we run that code. Okay, we, we get something like this. And the idea here is that we, we don't run them in sequence, we run them in parallel, and uh, the whole thing takes as long as the longest URL. However, since this uses threads, if you give it uh, uh, what's this, six URLs as, as here, then it will have to create at least six threads. But if you give it a thousand URLs, it will either have to create a thousand threads or it will have to actually, some URLs will have to wait and it will not be uh, completely in parallel. Or it will create a, a really uh, large, unacceptably large number of threads. Now let's see what the equivalent code would look with uh, uh, async await. And uh, here we will use the concrete library async io because it is built into Python. So it looks actually very, very similar. So instead of importing the standard uh, concurrent futures from the standard library, we import async io from the standard library. Instead of importing requests third party module, we import the AIO HTTP third party module. And uh, when, and these two functions are actually, uh, they are async functions or coroutines. So when running coroutines, we have to have this async io run entry point because this is basically where the event loop uh, is uh, initialized and run. As far as, uh, as the synchronous execution is concerned, the, uh, the code Runs, spends most of the time here, and it's stuck inside this run call until the whole program exits. And it has to be so because this is where the event loop is invoked. But once you call that run, then it arranges these coroutines to be called in parallel as requested by the user code. So this main coroutine creates this HTTP client uh, session. That's an AIO HTTP thing because it has less global state than requests and it creates uh, these, uh, these coroutine objects here. This is uh, uh, the thing. Here we can just call this uh, async def and it won't actually run anything. It will just create a coroutine object which we have to schedule with the event loop or await for it to actually run. So we create the list of these passive objects and we give it to this async io dot wait uh, uh, function which does these two things for us. It submits them to the event loop and it waits until all of them finish. And uh, we have to await that. And that's it. We don't care about their results because uh, we, they, they have side effect. They print uh, 
the, the, what they're supposed to print here, and they catch uh, exceptions. So let's see how that works. So this is the async, async IO code, and we can run it like this. So it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, the same effect. What we got is that we have the code that looks like uh, synchronous code and, and has the same look and feel, but works completely asynchronously. It has this uh, async with, uh, it's sort of like the asynchronous equivalent of a with statement where this enter and exit methods are async, but it works uh, pretty much uh, uh, the same way. So <coughs> in, in async programming, we, when using async await, we have to be careful of uh, several things. So first, as we already said, just calling a coroutine function doesn't do much of anything. It just constructs uh, an awaitable coroutine object. So this is different than in JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can, you can call an async function, and that will create a full-featured promise that will automatically run in the event loop. When you return to the event loop, this promise, of course, nobody will await it, uh, but uh, it will run at least for side effect. In Python, that's not the case. You either await this uh, coroutine object or nothing will happen or you can, you, can, uh, you can schedule it to run the event loop, but you have to, you have to, do, it, uh, you have to do it with some sort of uh, call. Like in async IO, there's this create task call that does that, 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 does that for you. Uh, the other thing people tend to be confused about, uh, at least in, in, in Python, judging by Stack Overflow questions, uh, await doesn't automatically introduce parallelism. In fact, it seems to do exactly the opposite. Like if you await A, await B, await C, then people say, well, but A, B, and C weren't run in parallel. Like, how is that? Is, is that a bug? Well, no, I mean, you said await. Await actually means wait. But the, the whole deal is that while you are doing your waits, other uh, coroutines can run at the same time. So parallelism is only present at the level of coroutines. But that's actually a good thing because coroutines are really lightweight. Creating a coroutine has nothing to do with creating a thread. It doesn't need to create some stack. It, not, it doesn't need to talk to the operating system. It's more like creating a generator or an iterator or, or something like that. It's a fairly lightweight object in as much as anything is lightweight in a language like Python. Uh, the other thing is, well, Obviously, inside these coroutines, no blocking code is allowed and no long-running code is allowed. So if you are, if you are calculating your pandas data frame or, or multiplying large matrices or doing your machine learning uh, stuff uh, inside a coroutine, well, then you will not only block the current coroutine, you will block the whole event loop. You, you have to be uh, aware of that. So when writing coroutines, uh, uh, use the same caution uh, that you would use when writing callbacks in some async system. So the stuff that you wouldn't be comfortable with putting inside a cold callback, don't put it inside the coroutine. Fortunately, when you have, uh, uh, you might have some uh, legacy code, like, uh, I don't know, an old database driver that simply doesn't have an async interface, or you might have the situation where you, where you really have to run some long CPU-bound operation, in that case, for example, async IO has this function run in executor that simply schedules this, this operation on a thread pool and suspends your current coroutine because this run in executor returns a, a, a suspendable and awaitable object. And when this operation is done in the thread pool, your coroutine will be automatically resumed and you will even get the result or the exception, uh, whatever the case may be. So it's really easy to run something off-thread, and you, could, you should do that as much as possible to ensure that at least as much as possible when you have a long-running code uh, in, in your coroutines. And finally, uh, be aware that all coroutines run inside a single thread. So if you, if you have... Uh, if you have some code that starts uh, multiple threads, especially these, these uh, uh, classic uh, async style APIs that in reality just create a, a separate thread in the background and this async call means that they will call your, your callback from another thread once the operation is done. Like I, I think some um, uh, streaming uh, libraries like these uh, um, Gstream uh, and, and 
that kind of thing does that a lot. So you should be careful, don't mix that with async IO. If you have to, then there's also a special uh, call which, uh, which to schedule something inside async IO in a, in a thread safe manner. There's this uh, call soon, thread safe, run coroutine, thread safe, so look it up. It's really, it's, it's not hard to, to call something from another thread, but you have to use a specialized API for that. So this is, this kind of thing I would say is where most of the talks on this topic sort of end. So you see how async await is implemented and uh, this implementation is specific to Python, but a very similar, uh, a very similar uh, logic is present in other languages, such as C Sharp. Uh, it also does this kind of thing where the await is actually a loop. Uh, Rust does the same thing, and I think JavaScript also does uh, a very similar thing. But there's still a lot of magic involved. Like, if somebody asks you, okay, but what does the await statement actually do? Like, if you, if you needed to expand the await statement into something, in a concrete coroutine, like, just how, how would you do that? I mean, you normally don't need to do that, but I think at some level it's good to have an idea what, what the compiler is actually doing behind your back, because when things go wrong, it's, it's, it's useful to, to at least have a concept of, of what's actually going on. So let's take a look at a, at a really simple coroutine. So in this, in this code uh, with, uh, with async IO, let's, in this parallel download, let's assume that we have slightly refactored the code to have a separate println coroutine, which reads uh, the, the actual data using a weight and then prints it. Like inside the program, it might look like, like this. So we split up this load URL to await this print len, and now we have this really simple uh, coroutine that, that prints, and the program runs the same way. Now, the challenge is, how would we expand this await statement into something that doesn't use await and doesn't use yield from? So what, what would it look like? So, what we know are two things. First, that println, when called, has to return an object that defines this under under await uh, special method, because that will that is what makes it awaitable. And uh, so we could just create a class that is called println and define an await method on it and have a constructor that accepts uh, this these two arguments, and that will be kind of the same thing. So we can do that. And what we also know is that a wait must return a running generator. So if it returns a running generator, then we can just implement it as a generator, at least in, in the first version. So this println, it has, it has two methods. One is the constructor, and the constructor doesn't really do anything. And that's really, that's really indicative of what we said before. This is why when you, when you just call a coroutine function, really nothing happens. It just stores, uh, it stores the initial state of these, of these arguments inside the object, and that's it. The real magic happens when you await it, and at this point, this await method gets, uh, gets called, and now we are in this lower level generator world. Now we can call our yield from uh, expression. So in the original function, we had await uh, response dot read, and here we will have uh, we will call response dot read, and then we will call under under await on that to get an actual generator, and we will yield from that generator, and the return value of the generator is the content that we're looking for. So it is a bit uglier than, uh, than uh, uh, just awaiting self-resp read, but it's pretty much the same thing. It's not too much of a complication, because then we get this content and we just print it. And this kind of code works exactly, exactly the same as uh, the, the original version. So let's take a look. We have it fear here, so println is a class, and we await an instance of that class. So if we run this, we get, we get the same thing. 
but we didn't learn much. Okay, we learned how to call the raw yield from, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not too useful. There's still a lot of magic involved. Now, we would like really to get rid of the yield from magic. And if we just go back to a slide before it, we had it right here. So every yield from iterable can be expanded to a, a, a while loop that looks just like this. So if we insert this kind of while loop into that under under weight, will that actually work? Well, let's try it. So here we have this and we, we add this. Of course, we insert instead of there, we had some iterable. Here we have this self.resp.read.under under await, this whole huge uh, chain of method calls, but it's, uh, it's uh, the same thing. So, uh, and, and the logic is exactly the same. We get the next value from, uh, this, uh, from this iterator. If we, if we actually get the next value, that means that the iterator wants to suspend. We yield this value, which we completely don't care about. And, and we do that as many times as necessary to handle all these suspensions and to propagate them to the event loop. And once the suspension is done, once this underlying iterator has an actual value for us, we catch the stop iteration exception and we get its value. And this value is actually our content. Note that in this case, we cannot actually use the for loop. It would be really nice to say, well, for, uh, I don't know, a token in uh, self resp read await yield token. But that wouldn't work because the for loop would swallow the stop iteration exception as an uninteresting implementation detail. But we actually care in this case about the exact instance of the exception because that instance contains the return value and we use the return value here. So let's see if, it this, wor if this works. That's the number four. So now we have this longer class which has this await uh, that uh, contains uh, uh, desugaring of the yield from uh, uh, expression. And if we run it, it works the same, but now with this version, we can actually do an interesting thing that we couldn't do with the yield from version. Now we can actually edit this code to observe the suspensions as they happen. Like if we just here add a print, like uh, uh, suspending self.url and then we add another print that says resuming self.url. Now, if we run the code, we can see all these suspends and resumes as they happen. And as you can see, depending on, on some details, like whether the site redirects to SSL, uh, how long the response is, and, and so on, there's, there's quite a number of these, uh, of these resumes. So, so the fact that some coroutine uh, suspends more than once is not just some academic thing, it's what actually happens. And, and this use, of, uh, this use of, of yield is allowing us to, to, to see uh, this kind of thing in practice. With yield from, we could never use, we could never write an equivalent print because the yield from is completely hiding this loop from us. It's hiding all the suspensions inside the expressions and, and we, would, we would never notice them. So, so this, version <coughs> this version actually uh, implements this idea that we have, uh, that we don't use a weight and don't use yield from. But we might not still be completely satisfied with that because, <laughs> you know, so if you, if you try to explain to uh, a, a Java programmer or God forbid a C programmer, like what, what, what does a weight do exactly? Then at some point he will ask you, okay, so, so what's a weight? Yeah, you'll say, ah, it's just like yield from. And he'll ask you, but what's yield from? Yeah, just like this for loop with, with a bunch of yields or you wouldn't really understand it, the for loop, but it, it's, it's a generator. Yeah, but, but what's a generator? Like in Java or in C, there's no yield, there are no generators. And, and you, you can't say that this kind of things can be implemented. I mean, it, there has to be a way to express this using no bullshit, honest to God code. <laughs> 
So let, 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 let's see, let's see how, how that would work. Like, if you, have, if you have any generator, like let's return to this uh, uh, sec generator, which just yielded 0, 1, 2. Like, what's, what's a generator in its essence? It's just a, a really nice way to implement an iterator. So what we could do instead, and I think I'll write it to, to uh, a file, we could implement an iterator that does the same thing. Let's, let's keep this in a, in a, like this as a reminder. So instead of having a, a, a def, we'll write a class. This class will have a constructor, and this constructor will accept this n. It will store the n inside it, because we will need to be able to access it from a separate function. And we will store some marker of the state to know that we have never been called before. And then we will write another function called another method called next. And this next method is actually invoked by this next function that exhausts any kind of generator. And here, what we need to do is check where we are. So when we are called the first time, state will be zero. And we need to return the value of n, right? And this n is actually available as self.n. But before doing that, let's bump the state to one, because we don't want to keep doing the same thing when, uh, when called again. So when we are invoked the next time, let's check if the state is one. Then we bump the state to two. And we return n plus one, right? And the next time, when we are called, the state will be two. So let's check that. Bump state, return n plus two. And finally, if the state is neither of these things, it means the state is three. So we just raise stop iteration. And we keep raising stop iteration no matter how many times we are called. That's what real generators do. So if we now, if we now do this, let's define it. OK. Now let's create an iterator. And let's, uh, oh, we have to give it something. And let's give it to list. Or we can immediately, yeah, whatever. It's the same thing, list of it. Oh, the sec object is not iterable. So there's one thing I forgot. And that's uh, that each iterator also has to define an iter method. Because an iter, me an iter method defines an iterable. And each iterator is also trivially iterable, and it just has to return self. OK. So let's try with this version. And now list of sec of 0. Yeah, it seems to work. Of 1,000, it seems to work as well. So, so we, we sort of converted our generator to a state machine. And so the question is, what would this kind of generator look when converted to a state machine? And <coughs> the answer is something like this. So first, we had this before. We have an awaitable class with a pretty much no op constructor and an await method that now isn't implemented as a generator, but it uh, has to, remember, as we said before, it has to return a running generator. So technically, it can also return an, any kind of iterator. It doesn't need to, to be a generator. So we instantiate an iterator class, and we return that from await. And the iterator class itself, it has to have this init method that, again, doesn't do much of anything, except it, it does one useful thing. It, it stores this state to the initial state of 0, and it has this silly iter method that just returns self. However, its next method now contains the actually useful code of uh, our iteration. So in case the state is initial, then what we want to do is we want to pick up this iterator. Now, we cannot use, store it in a local variable because we will need it once we are called again. So we, we have to store it on the object, and we bump the state. 
Now we have just bumped the state, but we didn't return. So the state will be one, and we will immediately get to this next function that exhausts the underlying iterator. And if this exhaustion was successful, then it means the iterator chose to suspend, and we got some object that we just want to forward to the event loop now with a simple return statement. Because what would be yield in a generator is return in the next. And we don't bump the state before that intentionally. So that the next time we're invoked, now this is the equivalent of a loop. Since we didn't bump the state, we will just get back here because the state will have been one, and we will do this again and again and again and again as long as the underlying iterator chooses to suspend. Once it no longer chooses to suspend, it will raise a stop iteration exception with, or mo most likely it's a generator, so it, it will do so alone. Nobody is crazy to, to do this except us here. But uh, <coughs> someone will raise stop iteration, and uh, we will get our value, which in this case is our content, as the value slot of the uh, exception instance. And then we print this, uh, uh, this length, then we bump the state to two, and immediately raise stop iteration, which tells our caller that we are done. Uh, if we also had a function, uh, if we had a value to return, we would raise stop iteration with an argument of that value, but since we return none, we can just raise stop iteration. And if this is called again, which async await won't do, it will keep raising uh, stop iteration. So with this version, I think that's number five. So this is this version written as an iterator manually implemented with uh, this await that, that uh, does this. And if we call it, we will get we will get the same kind of behavior. So this is the kind of thing that in a statically compiled language like C Sharp, the compiler does literally this. When you use an async function, it rewrites the function as a, an object that implements a state machine in some, in some special method. That's also what Rust does, and uh, that's what C++ will do. Python doesn't work like that because it's an interpreter, so it cheats when you, when you have, uh, it, it actually uses generators and, and it has this object that corresponds uh, to, to the stack frame uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the interpretation. But all the compiled languages do this kind of transformation, and if you look at it, it's really nice that they do it for us and that we don't uh, have to do it ourselves. So this is, pretty much the end of uh, this talk. Before uh, the questions part, let me just point you to some further reading, at least to the stuff that I found useful about that. One is by a very smart guy named David Beasley, who happens to be author of one of these modern uh, uh, async await libraries called Curio. And uh, he has a live coding video where he does, for 45 minutes, this live coding, he implements a full featured event loop inside, uh, uh, in front of live audience while cracking jokes. So please look at it. He's much better than me, and, and it's, really, it's really nice. And uh, the other <coughs> thing are articles uh, by another really smart guy who happened to write the other alternative async IO uh, modern library called Trio. Uh, and his name is Nathaniel Smith. So he, he has uh, uh, a number of really influential, uh, influential articles uh, on structured concurrency. So there's this, for example, notes on structured concurrency, where he explains uh, how just uh, uh, starting async tasks all around is sort of like starting threads without any control, and it's the modern async equivalent of uh, the Go, uh, of the Go statement. So, he argues that uh, we should have better, better tool, tools at our disposal, better abstractions for building really robust async code. And even if you don't use his library, it's a very useful article to read, and it influenced uh, uh, many developments in modern uh, uh, async libraries, including uh, async IO. So this is, uh, yeah, that, that's the whole talk. So are there any questions about any of this? Please raise hand. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was great. Um, uh, would you imagine uh, ha having some kind of Python environment where even async await as keywords go away and it just implicitly does all that? 
you know, like uh, some high-level user of uh, some, some kind of library? And what would it take to do something like that? Well, for, for <coughs> async await to go away, there are, there are, so, so if you just, if you didn't need to, to sprinkle your code with await, that's what you mean. So there, there are two issues for that. Uh, well, first, uh, it would probably require some sort of uh, green threads uh, to, work, uh, to work really transparently, and green threads have uh, implementation issues that they are hard to implement efficiently. But there's also another conceptual reason. Uh, Guido intentionally wanted awaits to be visible, so that in your code, <coughs> you know each point, you, you see it, it's, it's highlighted by the browser, each point, uh, by, sorry, the, your IDE, we each point at which uh, uh, the await may happen, so at which a context switch may happen. So between two awaits, you're free to write code as if it were atomic. So that's a big advantage in a way of thinking. It's advantage uh, over multi-threaded code, where these switches can happen at literally any time. Here, between two awaits, you are sure that nobody else will, will muck with your data structures. So it's actually considered a feature. Any other questions? Oh. Um, hi, uh, and thanks for the talk. This was really good. So um, my question is, um, this, uh, some of this seems obvious in languages that do have real coroutines, uh, because when uh, the bottom turtle yields to the, uh, to the uh, event loop, the event loop has access to that object and knows who to pull later when the file descriptor becomes available. But uh, what confuses me a lot is languages like Rust, where in Tokyo you don't have those constructs, uh, yet they still find a way to uh, wake up the, uh, the caller when the file descriptor becomes available. So do you have any insights in how that works? Well, exactly. I, I, th I think it, it works pretty much the same way. Like in modern Rust, you have an actual uh, wait. Uh, it, it's not, uh, it first it used to be a macro, and now it's like uh, a magic uh, property of the, of the future object. And then the compiler inserts something very similar to this yield from. So, so it converts the current function into, into a sort of uh, generator, and then it loops over the sub-generator, and I you, you have this whole uh, state machine thing. So what your Tokyo sees at, at the top level is just this uh, top level future. So what it does, it simply, uh, there's this executor which occasionally pulls uh, the future, and when the future suspends, uh, its uh, task is before suspending, just like here, to explain to the executor when to, to pull it again, typically using some kind of reactor and, and so on. So the, the, it, it works uh, pretty much the same, the same as in uh, Python. But uh, Tokyo doesn't even see the async await stuff. What it works with are futures. So, so it's sort of uh, like, like, in, uh, like in JavaScript, uh, where the code sees promises, and then uh, uh, this async def is just an implementation detail how you happen to implement your promise. And that's also a, a, a valid way of uh, looking at it. Uh, any other questions? Thank you, Herbert. Thank you.